Welcome to the Tech One Two podcast. I'm your host, John Campus, founder and CEO of Empist. Today, I have the pleasure of having one of our VCIOs, Ken Hughes, with me today in the studio. Today, we're going to discuss cloud and how your business could benefit from it. So, thank you for being in the studio today, Ken. John, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation. Absolutely. So, let's just start off. What What is the cloud? Cloud means a lot of things, but most basically, it's the delivery of IT capabilities across the internet. Uh, so there can be a range of them. Uh, um, almost everybody will be familiar with software as a service. So whether it's Salesforce, or I think about uh, whether it's uh, our law firm customers or our um, our membership organizations or our manufacturers, they all have at least one key application on which they run their business and. By and large, these days, they're choosing to um, consume those services and get the benefits by using applications out of the cloud. So that's one example of cloud. Okay, so wait, wait a second. You're telling me that the cloud isn't in the sky? Today it is, but um, yes, no. In fact, it's it's in a lot of places. It can be in um, hyperscale cloud providers like Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. It can be in cloud providers like Empest. Okay, well, fantastic. So... It sounds like there's a ton of use cases for the cloud and things that we've been doing for our clients, we've seen tremendous benefits from it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned hyperscale clouds. What 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 exactly is that? Well, these are those three uh, vendors that I mentioned. And I know there's there's a major provider in China that also has great great share in Asia. But um, when, when cloud, as we discuss it today and as I'm referencing, got started, there were very limited use cases. One of the early ones was, in fact, um, for still on-prem um, applications, but doing the dev server in cloud. There was a business case for running that server and doing your dev work in the cloud. So um, across time and across the many years, the... Um, there have become more and more use cases where uh, the, the 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 financial benefit and the service uh, delivery makes sense to run it out of the cloud. So we hear we hear public cloud providers, we hear hyperscale, we hear private clouds. Um, you know, there's different use cases. We've seen different u- use cases for customers. I mean, some of the factors. I mean, compliance requirements. Uh, where is the data being stored, especially if you're dealing with a customer or an organization in Europe? You want to make sure that you have protections there, GDPR, and various compliance. Um, but we've seen all these use cases. Um, what are what are we seeing the most of right now just within the customer base? Are they going public cloud? Are they going private cloud? Uh, what have you seen? Well, we do see some of it. For, for, uh, for organizations that have um, um, an existing... Um, I'll say commitment and orientation toward Azure, we will see on-prem workload continue to move to them. Uh, for customers that are not uh, committed to other platforms, commonly they they come to Empus because we are their service provider. Mm-hmm. And so uh, when they face a server refresh cycle, um, it, that is a good time to bring your workload to the cloud. There's there's economic benefits to it. Um, like what? What are some of the economic benefits? Well, uh, the one of the things that comes most to mind is that you uh, time value of money. Uh, you, the money that you put out is um, is spaced out each month rather than a large sum of money buying a bunch of servers and a bunch of expensive Microsoft licenses and such. So, um, you you you. More from a CapEx to an OpEx. Yeah, yeah, ca- yeah definitely yeah. moves it. For those that have a preference for CapEx versus yeah. OpEx, then you get to. Uh, consume your IT and spend on it um, in an OpEx way. So, but in an OpEx way, um, you know, a traditional on-premise equipment, you know, one of the things that we've seen um, in just across all industries is oftentimes if you're installing new on-premise equipment, you're not um, capturing or gaining all the benefits of all those resources uh, at the time of purchase, but you're usually purchasing and procuring a device that may be more than what you need because you're planning for a few years ahead before you have to refresh it again in the cloud with it being more elastic with it going up and down uh, going up or down based on your resources and utilization that definitely frees up cash for businesses to do more yeah well said 
uh, if you buy a server with the expect or a set of servers with an expectation of using them for five years, it has to be served um, sized to five years. And so you will uh, you'll be putting a lot of money out the door, and you won't use it until maybe year four of the of the server. So yes, it is a better use of your money to um, to pay for it when you need it, and to match your cash outlay from the time frame during which you're getting the benefit. Okay. So what do you think about uh, businesses that think that their data is more secure, you know, in their server room, in the closet, where they can just feel like they can touch and feel their their data, and they believe that it's more secure being in an office versus a cloud provider? We know that there's risks associated with any type of infrastructure that you may have configured, but um, what have you seen with in the industry, within clients, I mean, should security really be a concern, uh, less of a concern on premise versus in the cloud? Categorically, no. Uh, there are there are, are some enterprises that are very mature in their use of security, and if they are, they probably have a reason for that. I'm going to guess there's a compliance reason. A lot of the time, uh, compliance actually drives security, and compliance is not security, but by becoming compliant, you move in the direction of de-risking and having security. Mm -hmm. so, the, with, so if somebody had invested in all this infrastructure and all this security and all this technology um, locally and they had the on-premise, uh, I mean, what would, you, what would you, I know this is, would be a very difficult um, uh, assessment to be able to even throw out a number, but even just from a ratio perspective, for somebody to build the same security that is currently present in the cloud, present in the cloud on premise. Would you say it's, you know, I mean, is it, is it seven, six figures? Is it five figures? What is it? Seven figures for them to build that kind of security? Sure. Well, because uh, cloud providers like us and and others out there host for so many different customers, the the needed investments for security get uh, amortized or spread mm -hmm. across a larger customer base. So your cloud providers are able to spend more money and to provide a, a, a greater depth of security because those costs get spread across more, um, more enterprises. Okay. So when we talk about the cloud, you mentioned their services and we know 365 and, you know, companies have, it's actually one of the fastest growing technologies that is out there with a rapid adoption of cloud technologies, Microsoft 365 is a cloud, correct? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a suite of, uh, suite of uh, productivity and other services from Microsoft, okay. cloud-based. And, and then we hear, um, you know, offloading resources or workloads. So we talk, we, we look at files, we look at, perf uh, we look at files, we look at applications, we look at various software that can go in the cloud. But when we look at additional cloud resources, you mentioned as far as moving some things, some workloads from on-premise to the cloud, are you suggesting that it's more of an Office 365 type, or is it more of uh, an Azure? Is it what type of um, cloud deployment are you referring to? I would say, uh, for one thing that happens when we migrate to the cloud is uh, files, file usage is is not done on file servers on-prem anymore. And one of the nice things about that is that you don't need to remote into the office to get your files. You can get them on your phone. Um, you, can, you can get them as long as you can get to a web browser, you can get to them. So I would say that file access, um, universal access to files so that you can be more productive or be productive anywhere is a driver. And then again, uh, when you're faced with a server refresh, it, the math shows up pretty quickly that, that the benefit is toward just moving that into the cloud. Man, I, lo I love what you said, the universal file access. Like anywhere, anytime access of files and being able to access all of your information on the go is a tremendous benefit to organizations. Mm -hmm. You know, I was actually speaking with a, a client, uh, actually a prospect, a few days ago, and they were very frustrated by the way that they, um, b by what was required for them to access files. And one of the items that uh, was brought up is, you know, we're tired of opening up files and someone else tries to open them and they're read-only. We can't collaborate with them. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, does this happen anymore in the cloud? Um, well, it, that probably would come out of Google Docs or the Microsoft 365 Outlook. But yeah, collaboration uh, in the cloud is a big benefit. What I would say is for, for, for organizations that are not doing that kind of collaboration in the cloud yet, 
They're probably not doing it because they don't know what they're missing. I'm finding that once users know what can be done, you don't need to give them the use cases. They will find it out for themselves. They will say, oh my gosh, that's there. That will, they have every incentive to use those capabilities because it's in their benefit. So just make, get them to the water and they will find a use for, uh, for the cloud capabilities. Okay. So it's probably a lack of understanding. They don't know what they don't yes. know. And you're, you, you're discussing public cloud providers or any cloud. So let's go back to cloud. So we talk about public, we talk about private, we talk about hybrid, we talk about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, any AAS, um, as far as any technology out there. But what would be a benefit of an organization of having something, a hybrid cloud, where they still have some workloads on-premise mm -hmm. and others in the cloud? Well, it's it, it's just a matter of what the use cases are. So um, uh, every workload should be evaluated, and where uh, can it be most economically or appropriately served? So, but but if I'm really thinking about it, um, uh, some things like I could imagine a uh, an engineering heavy organization wanting to keep the data mm -hmm. local. Um, engineering documents are very large, and moving them over the internet all the time um, would, in my mind could quite likely favor keeping that local rather than doing that across the cloud. Um, and um, any any compliance reasons to keep data locally, like you say GDPR or something else regulatory, could argue for keeping that on. And then other things will simply be more appropriately um, consumed and delivered out of the cloud. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, having your files in the cloud, if you are an engineering firm, graphic design, someone who has very large files that they're working with, you're essentially copying those files back down. So that could impact productivity. And, you know, assessing what currently exists is extremely important. The assessment piece of it, you can't just say, oh, every company, every client is a candidate for the cloud. They may be, but it might not be the right solution for them. So how important is it to assess what an organization is using before saying, I'm going to put everything into the cloud? One of the best things about being a VCIO is that you always get to start with the business requirements. So we, we, we look at what kind of outcome are we trying to do, and then from there, then we assess. Um, we cannot carte blanche just say that everything should be in the cloud. So it really starts with where can this workload be? Again, I'm just going to say, where what's the business case? What mm -hmm. can you do you know, economically? Um, wh what provides the access that your users need? Uh, what lines up with a customer's budgetary approach? So once you once let's say uh, um, a, a company's outcome is that they want to go to a distributed workforce, mm -hmm. would you say public or private or on premise? Yeah, you um, could consider a private. Yeah. You can consider a private being on premise too. But mm -hmm. again, the cloud is just somebody else's computer. Pretty it's much. somebody else's server. There's a lot of technology and applications and platforms behind that. So just a very simplified. It's somebody else's system, mm -hmm. um, but. Somebody's going to be, they're going to be a distributed workforce. They're closing their office down. They have on-premise equipment currently. What would you recommend to somebody based on that? We've seen a lot of that, you know, during the COVID, through the COVID era, now post-COVID. And as people's leases come up for buildings and they have a smaller percentage of people coming into the office, they're, they're downsizing. And so uh, that is a common time for us to take infrastructure to the cloud. Um, I think it is supportive of a distributed workforce. Um, mm -hmm. The focus there is what do what do end users need to be productive? And some of it is, is collaboration tools. Some of it is access to files. Um, some of it is uh, enhanced uh, security capabilities. Uh, I've personally become uh, really impressed with a lot of um, the bottomless um, security capabilities that Microsoft is adding to theirs. They're, they're not the best in everything, but for a 365 subscription, you can cover a lot. You can really reduce your attack surface. There's just a, a breadth of security capabilities there. Fantastic. Yeah, we've seen we've seen tremendous benefits from that and seen our customers have had a, a, a great return on investment there. But on premise, you also have a phone system, you know, you have networking equipment, you might have printers. Um, how would how would that work? If I have a phone system, I have an old PBX mm. at the office, and we're closing our office down, or again, we're expanding, we're scaling, we're adding uh, more locations. What do I do with that phone system? 
Well, there's there's uh, there's two things. One, just speaking for Empus, we do hosted VoIP, so we can offer that. So going to an internet-based solution, uh, all of these come with uh, with an app that'll run on the phone. So that's certainly one approach. And then uh, uh, a lot of customers will also look at uh, Teams from Microsoft to, mm -hmm. to do that. Whether they go and um, and just use the the local PC as the phone device, or whether they go with some sort of Teams-enabled device, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for somebody that's moving an office and, and still is running on a POTS system, then it would be uh, time to look at, at VoIP. POTS, plain old telephone system? That's the one. Okay. All right, got it. Analog's not good? That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's, I, it's, you know, the analog <laughs> providers like it. Okay, it's good for some purposes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. That's a dinosaur piece of it. So um, we, we look at support. So uh, I'm a business um, in the cloud, uh, perhaps I work with some technology provider, some solutions provider, and I get everything into the cloud and now I'm in the cloud. What does support look like? What would support look like with these cloud providers? Are you working with the, your solutions provider that implemented this for you? Are you working directly with the third party who's hosting all my data? Mm -hmm. What is, what does support look like? Oh, well, it, it, I try never to say it depends. It depends on what the nature of that cloud service is that you're consuming. If you're consuming infrastructure as a service, then your provider of that infrastructure as a service will have a support organization. Um, and they have service obligations, service level objectives that they have for providing uptime, security, uh, recoverability, et cetera. Uh, if it is for um, an application, then that you just wind up having a direct relationship with the provider of that software as a service. So because, because we move everything into the cloud, is all my data protected? That is dependent on the security measures that your cloud provider takes. Um, they, uh, they do disclaim, you know, they do not take on complete liability. They, it's, it's quite clearly described in very long contracts, um, and they do disclaim a lot of liability for that. So there are, um, there are ways and reasons to do security on top of whatever the actual uh, application provider is doing. So you're, you're telling me that in the end user license agreement, they have it somewhat buried in there that they're not responsible for the data? By and large, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, you know, you would have sorry to Sorry to break the news to you. Yeah, it's it's uh it's something that needs to be reviewed, and yeah. you know you need to have the safeguards in place because should something happen to a cloud provider, whether it's private or public, whatever type of cloud it is, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, platform as a service, it always is good. It is best practice to also back up your data. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, you know if if we're talking about backing up mail systems in particular 365, but Microsoft. Uh, describes it as a shared responsibility. Microsoft is certainly going to provide an immensely available platform, but their backup and recovery is largely limited to versions of data rather than saying, hey, can you get so-and-so's calendar from 60 days ago? They left the company, but I need to see who they worked with. So, um, And another thing to think about in backing up your, your cloud-based um, collaboration software, email and such, is the um, uh, the fact that the, the the biggest reason to do a recovery is accidental deletion. There could be malicious deletion, but the number one reason that we get asked to restore um, information out of mail and calendar systems is in fact accidental deletion, um, which is not noticed until after Microsoft has or Google has stopped um, retaining that data. Which is usually about thirty days. Thirty days. Yeah, which is about thirty days. That's so if you find out. That someone deleted something off of off of SharePoint, OneDrive, or the email yes. after 30 days, and you don't have a third-party backup. What happens? It's gone. It's gone. Okay. It's gone. Yeah. All right. Well. By design. Yeah. <laughs> By design. Okay. Um, so being in the cloud, um, and we mentioned moving workloads, moving applications. What happens about all the upgrades that normally would have that would normally be someone's responsibility on an on-premise or perhaps even a private cloud. Sure. So uh, that is the responsibility and the, uh, well, the responsibility of the cloud provider. So in the past where uh, no matter what your business was, again, uh, you had to pay attention to IT. When you rely on a cloud provider, that's their job, which allows you to do your job. 
Mm-hmm. So um, with the uh, public op- or public, let's just say the cloud provider performing all these updates, uh, what happens if an update breaks something? Mm-hmm. What would happen to my business? You know, there's a patch that needs to be installed, similar to when we install patches on premise. Patch gets installed in the cloud. Um, what happens to the customers? They they're impacted by that. They certainly could be, but the cloud provider has every incentive and every obligation then to to fix that. Even even the largest of cloud providers will have outages or minor service disruptions or regions that are having slow performance, and so they um, they have the scale to um, and again the benefit rather than paying attention to just one enterprise, paying attention to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands. Of, of enterprises. So okay. um, they're well positioned and designed to to quickly recover from such things. So let's say I'm a business owner. I have all my data locally. Um, I'm concerned about moving things into the cloud because what if my internet goes down? My internet's not stable. Um, so I, you know, I may feel that I um, can still operate. I can still be productive. Uh, locally because the internet went down and I'm not dependent on the internet. Would you say that the benefits would outweigh um, the, the, um, the negatives of, you know, the pros versus cons of having something on premise and only being on premise because I'm afraid of the internet being down versus the pros of being in a cloud that can improve collaboration, it can improve um, operations, it can improve productivity? What would you say? Would the pros outweigh the cons? The uh, I'm going to go with the assumption, first of all, is that uh, the customer made an affirmative decision that the proper place for this is in the cloud. Uh, the solution to the concern about the Internet going down is to have a backup Internet line. Mm-hmm. And that was cost prohibitive not too long ago. But at this point, there's no reason not to have fiber for uh, for your primary and to have cable at least um, to keep to to allow yourself to do some minimal services on prem. I believe that that's the way to address the concern about dependence on the internet. Okay, so the cloud is accessible from everywhere, um, and there's nation states. There's a lot of attacks that are happening on public cloud providers. How concerned should a business be about hosting? and storing their information in a public cloud provider when it's accessible from everywhere. Are there, and also, are there any safeguards or mitigations that can be done in order to mitigate a risk of someone accessing our data? Well, um, speaking for Empest, we go to great lengths and put a lot of money into protecting the data, and we have these obligations in our agreements with customers. I'm still going to argue that um, any cloud provider is better positioned to harden their infrastructure and to recover from uh, some sort of adverse happening um, because they they have the scale and the focus on that compared to doing it yourself. It's it's just ever changing. I, I really want to emphasize. There's no enterprise, if there's one thing I've learned in my year and a half with Empest, uh, there's no enterprise that is too small to attract the attention of the bad guys. Um, $25,000 is a good day. Might not sound mm-hmm. like a lot, but to these guys, it, it, it's a good day's work. So there's no enterprise that is not interesting. You're, you're not too small to be um, of interest to somebody. It's economical. It's economical still to attack basically everybody. But wouldn't they be more incentivized to go after the 800-pound gorilla versus the small, the small business? Yeah. Um, you're, you're talking about the large enterprise, meaning yeah, all these be, customers yeah. out here. Um, perhaps. But, you know, you take um, uh, smaller enterprises may not be investing as much in their, in their protection. Hmm. Um, public sector schools in particular um, – um, what do you so call it's low hanging fruit. Low hanging fruit for yeah. I mean these these are these wind up being on average softer targets, and yeah. so those would be good good enterprises to say this is really hard to keep up. Let me just make this somebody else's responsibility. Okay. So um, as part of um, cyber liability policy, an organization um, also needs to protect their data. Uh, they need to make sure it's available as well. Um, so you talk about disaster recovery and business continuity. Um, utilizing a cloud provider, um, are there benefits to being with a cloud provider for disaster recovery and business continuity versus just doing it um, internally? It depends how robust you want to be. Uh, I think that 
business continuity and disaster recovery is a higher bar to clear. Um, there's a um, there's set expectations on what will be recovered, in what order. There's playbooks, that type of thing. To me, that's a higher order of expectation, demand, and cost um, compared to just recovering your files or maybe standing up your VMs again. Um, so the uh, just everything benefits. There's a reason why millions of times the decision has been affirmatively made to move that workload to a cloud provider. And it, whether it's economics, security, recoverability, um, there's not too many use cases. Well, there's an awful lot of use cases that argue for it, but there's certainly reasons to keep it on-prem too. Fantastic. Well, Ken, I really appreciate you being in the studio today. Do you have any closing remarks for our audience? Thank you for joining. Fantastic. Well. What's really important when you're selecting a cloud, there's many different options. It's truly doing that assessment and making sure that you align the cloud with whatever business outcomes that you have. It isn't just signing up, going to a web page, signing up for a cloud provider, storing your data there, because it may not be fulfilling all the needs that you have for your business, or perhaps it is today, but not in the future. So we really appreciate you being with us today on our Tech One Two podcast. Please stay tuned for our next one. Thank you.